Yep. <sighs> Delicious. My mic is just uh my beer my beer cracks have just been too too much sound quality for the Yeah, mic. I don't know what's going on. We'll have to try and troubleshoot that later, but whatever. Yeah. Not the end of the world. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to beat a dead horse and draw this out too far cuz it's Father's Day and I think all of us have stuff to do, so we're just going to get straight into it today. Welcome everyone to the Aged Out podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Fantini, and with me as always is Evan Wall. And now let me go through my spiel before we get into today's guest. Hit subscribe on the YouTube channel if you're watching there. Share the video, like the video, drop any comment you want to let us know what you think about the episode and all that good stuff or suggestions for future guests. Check out social media, Facebook, Instagram, just slash Aged Out Podcast, super easy to find. Uh, hit us up on patreon.com slash Aged Out Podcast. To give us any financial support, you can give as little as a dollar a month. You know, we're always trying to upgrade equipment, improve the quality of the podcast. So there's that little shill. Um, we're on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you can find other stuff you listen to. Um, keep spreading the word. Check out uh, LoneStarPercussion.com. Use the discount code AGEDOUT. Save yourself $10 on any order of $50 or more. Super easy to do. Helps us, helps you, helps them. It's a great opportunity to get some gear a little cheaper. Uh, if you're an educator, give it to your students. Save them some money. Say Their parents, I'm sure, will appreciate it. So now that I got that out of the way, Evan, take it away and introduce the guest, and we'll just uh, get to hanging out. Absolutely. And actually joining us from the Lone Star State, even though that's not where he's from originally, which we'll get into, is a gentleman that I had the pleasure of marching beside for an entire summer and actually riding the bus beside for an entire summer. So uh, my former seat partner, welcome Oliver Delato. What's up? Oliver. What's up, guys? It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, probably a long time coming since I've known you since 2010 <laughs> when we marched crown together. But uh, yeah, man, you're about to uproot, which I guess we'll get into in a minute, but been in Texas for a good little clip now, haven't you? Yeah, ever since I moved here in 2016 for grad school, so about five years now. Did you go to UT? Yeah, I went to UT Austin for my master's. Nice. In percussion performance or percussion? Mm -hmm. Nice. How was that? Was it stressful? Was it crazy? Yeah, super competitive. You know, Texas being a huge band state, you know, UT being the prestigious university that it is, there's a lot of competition within the studio. But, you know, it was a very fulfilling experience and it only grew me um, to where I am today. So it seems like a massive school, just that whole campus and like everything's bigger in Texas and just, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> was like the, the studio massive no not really i mean a lot of people ask me that it was only about 30 at the time um that's pretty normal or i guess average you know there's a school up here where i am now unt where they over have a, over 100 kids in their studio you know what i mean so never heard of it what's that never heard of it okay <laughs> just kidding um uh, being facetious but yeah mm-hmm. man um i'm sure we'll re circle back around to uh, what you've been going on now and your time in Texas and teaching and learning and all that, but mm-hmm. kind of give us a little bit of the, the backstory, uh, where you're from, how you got into music, how you got into percussion, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm originally from Southern California. I know a lot of, not a lot of people know that about me. They did not from, know that. Right? Uh, yeah, I was... I was only there for like the first four years of my life, but uh, I mentioned that because I can remember my dad taking us as a family to Riverside, California, to the Blue Devils home shows. So I remember watching BD in like the mid '90s, early '90s, and you know, every, like every time I go home, my dad will pop in some VHS tapes of you know those shows because he still has those clips and, and a VHS player uh, player believe it or not. So um, I've always grew up, grew up around drum corn and it, you know, being uh, in Southern California, my dad exposing us to that at such an early age. No wonder you are such a BD fanboy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember Evan. And I remember. <laughs> yeah. Then. Tori be like, Oh, it's the blue devils. I'm like, yeah, we're trying to beat them. Like yeah, we're, <laughs> right, on right. we're on their yeah, level. We're on their level. I'm almost, I'm almost 30 years old, man. I'm still a fan of blue devils and what they stand for. And, and all the way. Me too. Do. Yeah. Me too. I have grown um, so, to appreciate them as I've aged. I wasn't a big fan when I was younger, but as I learn more and and like get a better grasp of the big picture when you watch them, right. I'm definitely they're growing on me a lot year by year. New York Yankees of DCI, man. Basically. Pretty much. Um so yeah, uh after 
after I lived in California for the first four years of my life, we moved out to Virginia, which is actually where I was raised. Uh, I went to a small high school in Southwest Virginia. Uh, and during that time, uh, I actually, my first instrument was, was piano. I started taking piano lessons from uh, the local music teacher at my church in second grade. And then it wasn't until I was in fifth grade when my dad got me and my little brother our first practice pads and uh, we started getting introduced to percussion and more specifically rudimental percussion that way. We just started watching a ton of YouTube videos uh, and, and learned that way. And then, um, of course, I, I marched snare drum in high school uh, for the four years I was there and actually in eighth grade. And while I was in high school, I actually marched competitive drum corps, uh, marched Caballeros, DCA corps in 2008. Which, How old were you at that time? In 08, I was 15. Whew. Yeah. So it worked out because I, was, I think I was a freshman in high school at the time. Um, my dad was retired. So the way DCA works is it's, it's only a weekend thing. So as soon as we got done with school on Friday, we would load up in the van. And my dad would, would take me and my little brother up to New Jersey. And we would spend the weekend there and then come come back down and be ready for school Monday morning. So I did that for a year. I marched there in 08. And then, um, then the whole time my, my goal was to march Carolina crown. That was like a dream core at the time. So in 09, I wasn't quite ready for the, um, the crown experience. So I got some more experience at Glassman. Did you then, go to uh, a crown camp in 09? I, th- yes, I did. Yes, okay. I did. Yeah. The one in uh, Fort mill. I was there. <laughs> uh, Evan Evan marched with you, and I almost marched with you in 09. That's was, right, Michael. Was... I, re- I remember you from yeah. uh, G-, G West. Is that what it's called? Yeah. I can't even remember. Yeah. yeah. G West. What yeah, it was called. Uh, <laughs> Jackson right. Landry and myself, according to Casey O'Neill, who I went to college with, said that oh, Jackson gosh. and I were uh, the last two cuts that year for the ninth spot. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I also remember a couple of uh, other dudes from Michigan um at that camp can't remember the name tony, exactly tony but... felder was there a lot of those tony. red line people were there tony felder right. uh, i think brent eccles was there for the 09 audition and then oh did uh meredith bailey uh, was auditioning and weber wow. Jeff, was it what's his name last name weber did he march the 09 summer he marched 08 j webb john okay. weber marched yeah 08 okay all right all right wow you guys have some incredible memories <laughs> like wow Dude, sometimes i just pull it out i'm yeah, like i don't right. know i remember that right, right. <laughs> So you, you're talking about your dad, like it, giving mm-hmm. you practice. Spreads. Was he involved in the activity also? He was. So my dad marched drum corps before DCI was a thing. So he marched um, the uh, Buccaneers in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut in the, in the late 1960s. Right, because DCI, like the first year wasn't until like 72. So this is before DCI was a thing. And my dad played wow. snare drum and, and, and tenor drum, right? The single tom. Yeah. Um, but uh yeah, so he 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 obviously when he was a bachelor for like 20 years after that, he he didn't pick up sticks since then and then since he had kids, right? He, he picked up the sticks again and got us into drum corps. So, okay. yeah, my dad was a drummer. Right on, right on. That right. makes sense. Mhm. And huge, then go ahead. I was no, sorry. Say, he like he's always been such a huge support with the, with the drum corps stuff cuz he knows like he never got yeah. a chance to march DCI or do the whole like tour experience. So he was always at my camps with the video camera and, you know, willing to take us here and there, which is awesome. Dude, I can, uh, I can sympathize with that. My dad was very mm-hmm. similar to that. Um, always about it. Just super supportive. He never did like drum corps or anything like that, but did march and band in high school. So he's like, I'll take you to the camps and drive them. We can hang out. And like, I remember your dad being at the crown camps. I remember that. And then he'd volunteer on tour. He mm-hmm. both summers I marched. He went on tour and like cooked and like prepared food. Right. And then he'd just be in the stadium watching an ensemble. He loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, so how was it then? Obviously, the Caballeros is probably a little bit more mentally digestible for a kid of that age. Being the weekend warriors and going up, uh, you get to go home, sleep in your bed, and get a kind of recharge. But going on tour in 2009 with Glassman, you're what like a sophomore, junior in high school. Mm-hmm. Was that just like? an eye-opening crazy experience of like whoa this is way more difficult or different than i thought it would be yeah very much so man just the biggest thing was just being away from home you know being that young being away from home from all my friends for for that amount of time um it just made me grow up grow up really fast 
You know what I mean? Um, but I loved it. I, I remember. I remember thinking at the time. I remember just we were walking. I was the, to put our equipment away at the one night in spring training, and I was like, man, I was just like, I felt so blessed to be doing what I'm doing at such an early age. You know what I mean? I was like, wow. And I, you know, I had this thought. I was like, I cannot see myself going anywhere else. You know, I, I never felt that uh, that much support and just being like with some some group of people for at that capacity, like the family aspect. You know what I mean? I played baseball growing up and been a part of whatever different clubs and teams, but just being in a drum corps when I was that young, I was like, yeah, these are my people. And this is where I want to be. This is my family kind of thing. So. Right. It, it definitely creates a unique bond. It's mm -hmm. everyone listening, take this with a grain of salt. It's no way in any capacity, the same consequences or risk. But a lot of times, like I'll refer to people as like going to war, or, like, boot camp or something like that you are all just sharing such a common experience and a common bond that you can relate to each other in a way that no one else outside of anyone doing the activity can unless mm -hmm. they've done it it's I, I would say it's similar to somebody who's like a veteran which shout out to all the veterans out there and active military but like they have an experience that only other veterans can relate to yeah. so that that kind of always like made me feel like that like you march drum course like we already immediately have a common bond because we shared an experience that was very unique. We've uh, but we we get it. We've both you gone get it exactly. You've both right. gone through the fire. Like it, when a drum corps that 150 people goes through that mental and physical rigor of that summer, that bonds you. You're all getting your butt kicked together. And like Evan said, it's not only you you understand the experience, but you're you acknowledge that that you're all getting your butt kicked or getting your ass worked like it's just exactly right and you bond yeah. over it and you embrace it and you become great friends and it's awesome right Man michael you mentioned the the mental and physical rigor a lot of people ask me um how how is drum corps that hard it's just a musical activity you're just doing band all summer but i i explain it to them i'm like it's it's harder, like it's physically harder than these three a days that football kids have to go through, right? And and I wholeheartedly believe that because when you're when you're playing a sport like that, sure, it's physically hard at the time. But what do you do at the end of the day? You get to go home, right? You get to sleep in your own bed, right? You have the comfort of, you're in the comfort of your own space, and you come back and do it the next day. But in drum corps, it's like you're locked in, you're locked in for multiple multiple weeks, and this is what I you mean, do it's, for hours. It's it's high eighty like 87 days straight with like a free day or two in the middle. And like you said, exactly. exactly. Yeah. You're not like hitting each other, like physically tackling each mm -hmm. other. But I mean, you're, it's, I would agree. It's, it's definitely hard. a week of spring training is a hundred percent harder than a three a day practice on a football team for a day. Mm hundred -hmm. percent. So you're talking, you're saying, I don't, I don't think I'll ever see myself leaving but you get done with your 09 Glassman experience. Was it before this? Obviously, maybe not before the summer ended, but was there like a time after the summer where you were like, I'm still going to go back? And then I guess what changed to motivate you to go audition for Crown for the next summer? Yeah, I mean, I really um, envied Crown throughout that summer. I mean, the 09 season, seeing you guys, you know, do your thing with, with that show was absolutely incredible. You know, I used to... Glassman, we would go on, go on pretty early, and then we have time to go watch lots and everything. And I would always flock to Crown lots and and watch their, their super super clean <laughs> nine lit paradiddles, paradiddle diddles over and there's over. A, again. There's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I really enjoyed them that season, you know, and that only like heightened my interest to, to join them for the next season. And then um, Zach Schlicker actually hit me up and said, "Hey, man, like." Saw you this summer or this past summer at Glassman, um, would invite you to come out to one of our crown camps. So the rest was history from there. Yeah. Huge shout out to Zach. Exactly. Yeah. I love Zach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That summer was, uh, I'm sure that was interesting too, for your first crown experience. It was interesting for me as my second summer, just, there was a lot of unique challenges in and of itself, like people getting hurt or having to leave or just, there's a lot of injuries. <laughs> There was, but, yeah, and that yeah, there was a, that show was a lot of pressure for it felt like to me a lot more pressure than the summer prior to like a lot of changes. Do you remember that, dude? Yeah, I mean, we learned an entire opener that we played all the way through Atlanta and then right. never played it again the rest of the summer. It was like a two minute chart. 
Do you like, remember... all right, we're going to change the closer. Right, right, right. Do you remember that one rehearsal? And we, actually, you know what? I think it was a show day in Kalamazoo, Michigan, when um, Lee Bettis taught us the, like, the rest of the drill or something like that. You know what I mean? Because we had the people... Uh, we had holes in the in the snare line. We had to fill everything in. And I remember this one rehearsal where just Lee ran it, and he just, you know, in, in typical Lee fashion, just we ran, we ran, we ran, and we made it. Was that the one with like the really tall grass? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I remember that. I remember a couple mm-hmm. of Lee rehearsals. That one where we filled in a hole, and then another one when we did a clinic at Western Carolina, where we finally had the set numbers. Because that summer we started out nine five and five mm-hmm. in. By the end of the summer, we ended up seven, four, and five. And I remember that day, we were like, we don't actually know dots for the ballad. Like, we're at seven snares. We learned it at nine. Like, we don't know. And they were just like, just just even it out. And we're like, okay. Right. We're in the middle of a clinic in Western Carolina University, which is in the middle of nowhere. Right. Beautiful. Uh, everybody... Beautiful zone, though, in the mountains. Dude, yeah. Beautiful campus, that. but there yeah. wasn't anything nearby. Yeah. <laughs> I remember people kept asking, what happened to the girl? We are like, she left. Right. Or Ashley. Oh, got mm-hmm. hurt. Sucks. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so summer 2010 was fun, but tough. Um, mm-hmm. That summer was crazy hot. We went to Kansas. I hate Kansas. If you ever do drum corps in Kansas, it's just not, not the yeah. best. Dry That's the heat. worst. That was by far worse for me than any other state. Maybe rivaled by like Mississippi or Arkansas, but kansas Ugh. yeah no i agree i mean every time i go back there with um, the groups that i teach now even kansas or even like oklahoma it just feels like i'm in an oven mm-hmm. right yes i live in texas but i still think that kansas and that that sort of midwestern um that stint maybe because it's so barren right there's not it's in the prairie so there's very little trees there's no shade well whatever but it's yeah it's like it's like an oven man it cooks you out there Whew. um so it took summer of 2011 off. Um, then you come back. Did you contemplate going anywhere else? Did you were just like, no, nah, I'll go back to Crown. Like, that's, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Um, so I took 2011 off to go graduate and, and go be a senior in, in high school and enjoy, like, Lake Week with, with my friends. You already marched three years of drum corps and then decided to go graduate. Yep. <laughs> that's, dude, that is wild. Very few people can say that. Very few. Yeah, people. man. I remember Frankie telling me we we're like, so Frankie used to Frankie Cummings, for those of you who don't know, um, he lived in New Jersey and he actually was my ride down to the crown camps. So he'd pick me up at an exit in Virginia. We'd go to down to the crown camps. I remember at one gas station, Frankie, we were just talking about our experiences and he said, man, we're because he was young at the time, too, when, when we were marching together. And he said, yeah, man, we're, we're growing up too fast. You know what I mean? We didn't really have the typical high school experience that a lot of our friends did. Um, n- no regrets, obviously, but, you know, just if, ever since he told me that, I'm like, man, you're right. Like, all my friends are out playing video games or sports or going on family vacations, but we were we were doing drum court at the time. So. Your summer was eat up with uh, sunscreen and Gatorade and <laughs> sweat. Exactly. Gatorade, man, I... <laughs> I don't crave Gatorade these days like I like I do when we're in the drum corps thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And the it's like the fake crazy. powder mix Gatorade. Like it's not the bottles of Gatorade you buy at the gas station. It's the kind where they have those like <laughs> massive coolers, fill them with water, just dump a bunch of powder and sugar, like Gatorade Kool Aid. Right. Or like the Crown it, Sweet Tea. Oh, that was know classic. What about. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I would always save the sweet tea for. Uh for a snack after the shows mm-hmm. or else it would just hit me too heavy but i go i go pretty hard on it it's like all right dinner or a snack like i'll, right. I'll have the sweet tea during lunch before perk ensemble not gonna be good right um <laughs> that was a young line though now you think about like you and i think obviously frankie and then i think that jackson landry had like gone home in the middle of spring training to like go to graduation then came back for high school or something like that i think he left for a few days to go back to novi mm-hmm yeah, um, I remember. I remember Zach used to call him Novi, Novi kid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a young group. Um, mm-hmm. Who else was on that line? Let's see. Uh, Brent Google. Eccles, Tony, uh, Ashley, Andy, Andy Kim, Andy Kim. Kim, Andy Kim. Love Andy. Yeah, um, you, get... Frankie, and me. Mm-hmm. So I think that was the nine. John mm-hmm. Weber, right? For a little bit, right. 
So, um, but yeah, man, that was a, that was a tough year. It was fun and it had its own rewards, but as much, I would say, as it grew like you guys up as younger kids, like it pushed me in different ways as far as like just being like inserted into this role of like leadership and all of a sudden just having to be like, all right, you're the guy, like hold the core together. I was like, okay. No pressure, (laughs) no pressure, man. Center snare. Your feet better be in time. Dude, yeah. I, I, yeah. I do not envy anybody who's ever been a center snare. It's Mm -hmm. stressful. At least it was for me. Maybe other people had better experience, but anyway uh 2012 summer had its own challenges as well you guys were dropping like flies man during spring training oh i heard gosh yes yeah so i went <laughs> back for the 2012 season um which is amazing i had i had some of my friends uh i mar- i met at gmu um, like we all went out there together uh, kennedy carey lucas van Giesen. um yeah it was, it was a very very tough show probably actually you know definitely the hardest show i've ever marched it may be one of like the hardest DCI shows ever. I don't know. It's just, right. it's crazy hard. Right. Physically and mentally challenging, man. Notes for days, or it's a Tom Hannum book. That was his first year there, actually. Mm-hmm. And just like that opener. Oh, my goodness. We so, never halted. <laughs> so I don't know if you know this, but uh, mm-hmm. you and I almost marched together again in 2012. Um, I, I didn't was, know that. I, yeah. So I had been telling Josh Bricky, because I was in X that winter, that I was going to come yeah. do Crown in 12 for my age out. And uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't until about three weeks, two weeks before the camp where I was like, hey, I think I'm going to go to Blue Coats instead. And so I just remember, because like, obviously I had March winter with Frankie and uh, Zach Janczewski. And then, and so. Also T Gas and Joe Woody. Exactly. So it was like two of each. And I ended up going to Blue Coats instead, obviously, and had a great summer. But I just remember uh-huh. in spring training, I was getting like inside details from Zach and Frankie through text message on like how freaking hard that show was. Like I, I just remember one day I asked him, I was like, hey, how was your all's day? And he goes, well, one, I forget who even said it. They were just like, yeah, we had five snares on the field today because everyone's freaking hurt. <laughs> this drill sucks. Yep. It was rough from I don't, what I understand. It, it was rough. And I don't remember too many specifics or like details about the, the spring training, cause, or really even this summer. Um, but yeah, I do remember it just being really, really hard you know, learning experience, you know, for all of us. Who else was on staff that year? So you had Jay Bricks. Was there anybody else teaching the snares and who was teaching the quads at that point? Or was it Paul teaching quads? No, I was Dean Hickman. Oh, Dean was there. That's right. And Paul was in it. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least the staff that year could like provide some like comedic levity because Josh is hilarious and Dean is just super chill. And Super even kill, chill. yeah. What a great what a change, change. right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that show. I remember seeing it for the first time in person, like you said. And I was like, "Well, classic." They're just running and gunning. I was mm-hmm. like, "Man, this looks hard. This sounds hard." Because mm-hmm. there's just cold attack stuff like at your eyeballs. It's like on the run. It's like, oh no, not quite yet. <laughs> right, right, but. Ended up being a, a great show, a killer show at the end. Uh, fanfare for the, was it for the common man? Is that was called? Um, uh, for the common good. For the common good. Okay, yeah. played fanfare, but anyway. Right. So, you have two years of your like, what was your dream core that you said earlier, like that you always aspired to to land at, but then you had a change of heart. <laughs> exactly. What, uh, what motivated that? So uh, in 2013, I was fully moved out of the house. I was in college then. And, you know, through, throughout my time while I was still in high school doing drum corps, my parents really supported me. But obviously after I turned 18 and they said, you want to keep doing this thing, you got to support yourself. So I took 2013 off and got a job, right, and saved up for the summer of 2014. When I was looking for groups to march for in 2014, um, you know, I, I really wanted it to be special, memorable, obviously, because it was my age out. And I had a choice. I wanted to either want to go to SUV or Blue Coats. Um, did a lot of research. You know, SUV was hot at the time. They're still hot. Um, but, you know, not to knock them at all, but I just, I just didn't want to. They just have a very unique and very distinct style um, percussively. So I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, adapt that much for my age out. And I had a lot of friends at the time 
talking up blue coats you know what i mean a huge fan of blue coats 2013 obviously 2012 michael that show was amazing drumline was incredible um so mm -hmm. i just sort of followed that trend and went out to went out to blue coats um for my age i wanted something you know long story short i wanted something new and different for for my age out right um, so i went to the atlanta camp the the, the satellite camp got invited to the January camp and then I earned my spot for the 14th season. Killer, killer program, killer mm -hmm. line. Uh, just a bunch of very talented dudes on there. Richard uh, Ramos, Jason Schladeweiler, Ryan Ellis, Mike Davis. You, dude, just, uh, what's his name from Florida? I'm blanking. Jerry, is that his name? Is he in there? Or that was uh, 15. I think I can see in yeah, my head who you're 15. talking about, Evan. I don't know his name. Yeah, yet. yeah, and yeah. Um, Connor Yasuda, uh, Manny Marquez, and Pulse Dudes. Right. Yeah. Arjun, of course. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot about Arjun. Arjun. Dude, he was yeah. heck, he was hella young, too. Dude, he marched um, inside of me. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what's this kid doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they put you on there to surround him with good sound. Um, yeah, 100%. Exactly. <laughs> You have a pretty iconic moment, though, from that yeah, show. I'm glad like, we're bringing this lot up. Hype, lot oh, Hype yeah. Central. Uh, yeah. The uh, the epic Gok Block quarter note display. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of people just were like, is this just like a joke? Is this for fun? <laughs> they didn't realize it was actually like something that was from the, the chart, from the piece. But, so, yeah, yeah, it's actually an, that that um, is actually original uh, part from the from the opener, like from the opening score. Um so, so when you all got the music, was that timing. written written in the chart? It was, yeah. How did you end up with it? Did it just yeah. luck into it in the drill? Like you were in the right spot by the way they wrote it? Yes. So for the first half of spring training, um, we learned the opener drill. And I actually wasn't the one with the Gok Block solo. It was, it was the end quad. My boy Ryan Ringold, um, Pulse dude, he had the, he had the block. Right, and he played that solo, but we changed the drill, and they were like, "All right, who's gonna play the the block now?" Snare one, and it happened to be me. So, um, yeah, that's how it worked out. It, it, it worked out um, from from a, dr a drill change, and uh, a lot of people ask me like, "Where where did you even put it? Like, how did you even carry it on your drum?" Um, but I actually had a, a double stick bag, opened up the middle of it, and created a little pouch, and then put mm -hmm. the block in there, and then um, just sort of rigged it up. It's the tension rods, and then <laughs> I remember. I remember Roger being like, "Hey, this this doesn't look good. Like, we're gonna change it. We're gonna change it." He kept telling me that, and he sees it again in July. This is terrible. I don't want. I don't like this. We're gonna change it. August finals week. This is okay. We'll go with it. <laughs> what yeah. he wanted to take out the gawk block part? No, no, no. He didn't like the way it was displayed on my drum. It just kind of looked ratchet. You know oh, what I mean? Okay. He wanted it to be a little more sophisticated. Yeah, Roger's um, very, very about the aesthetic. He's, oh, very he's much. Very so. aesthetically focused. Yeah, I'm very meticulous. Yes, yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. So the first time you did it in like a lot, were you just like in your head, like thinking this is ridiculous, or were you like, I'm just gonna rock this? <laughs> oh, I, I thought it was ridiculous. I thought it was ridiculous. I mean, we had Blitz Blue Coast a lot, and they're always huge. So I remember people like looking at it and vibing out. You know, I'm just like, dude, I'm not even vibing out this much, and I just everybody always wanted to um, wanted to make me, you know, tick or laugh or smile or something, you know. But I had to maintain, right, of course. You know? <laughs> it became so, such like a thing like people knew where it was coming and they're just like screaming like, oh exactly and you're just like just bobbing your head with it and stuff. exactly and i was like by the end of the season man people were just expecting you like give it to me give it to me all right here's some 188 quarter notes <laughs> yeah and you're just, i'm sure you're just like all right just just like bite your lip like don't don't laugh. <laughs> right no Dude, honestly I, it was it was it was odd because when you're playing it on the field you could you, you have the the melody going on so you know like how many right but when we're in the lot it's just me and me trying to stay with the met and it's a mixed meter piece so i was like okay here's my bar of four four here's my bar of three four sometimes i would count to 18 i, I can't even remember but it was it was not a, it was not easy it wasn't like four bars of four it wasn't so, like that it was so you're like doing being, that counting calculus in your head and everybody around you is trying to distract yeah, you and exactly. just like make you yeah. screw up and yeah, exactly <laughs> on the field you were like pretty isolated weren't you weren't you in the very middle set zero man yeah set, ugh. Money shop, get out your cameras, <laughs> folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. And the only time we actually like rehearsed it was uh, finals week uh, in Indiana because I can remember we spent a day on each movement. Like the Monday, I guess, of finals week was the opener day, and the Tuesday, blah 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 blah. 
Uh, so we, we just dug in on the opener that whole day. And I can remember um, well, during Ensemble, we would re they would reset just so I could nail that tempo without the Met. You know, we, we never really, really dug in and rehearsed my quarter notes uh, all, all year. And then it happened to be like on finals week. And I was like, all right, you know, reset, you know, you're a little slow, reset, you're fast, but like ever so slightly. So they really wanted to make sure it was perfectly in time, obviously. The rest of the course were like, dude, stop making this reset yeah exactly you're <laughs> speeding up come on man <laughs> my heart's racing dude i can't help it. right but you also have uh just a killer drum line that year the book was very tasty awesome the show tilt very iconic blue coat show uh were you ups or downs on the split singles downs downs i figured it was five down four up but mm -hmm. ah, it's all right Mm -hmm. you can say you played split singles but <laughs> right it yeah, was I good remember. too it was okay it was okay <laughs> <laughs> um i remember we had a bunch of debates on how, how we were gonna bring our sticks down afterwards and of course everyone chimed in chimed in chimed in because everyone wanted to do a cool crazy visual afterwards but we ended up just think just going with the classic release down whatever <laughs> Might as well not create too much stuff to have to clean. Right. Well, it's, I mean, it's blue coats. You got to be about the visuals, right? It's all about the hype. It's all hype. about the hype. <laughs> clean the, is the best hype, as 100%. Travis Peterman would say. Oh, oh man. Chris, Chris Gary told us that at George Mason. That's, that's what he'd always say. He said, clarity is the ultimate hype, or clarity is the coolest hype. It is. I, I, I mean, think about it. I mean, obviously, our ears are all really well trained at this point. We know what's good, what's bad, and stuff. Like, if I'm in the lot, I'm going to go watch the group that's really clean. I don't care if they're doing stick tricks or like, oh, performing. So like, they could be robots. And if it's nasty and just nails, like I'm going to want to watch that group over the one that's mm -hmm. hyping up, playing dirty. Yeah, man, you can't nah, if you can do both. Group. If you can do both, kudos. I'll watch that all day too. Right. I think that's still why I have such a deep appreciation for um, like, Tom Monk's lines and cadets lines and all, everything that Tom Monk's has been associated with. Oh, yeah. He obviously has evolved through the times too. I think anybody who's a writer and arranger has through the change and evolution of DCI, but there's just something so clean and clear about what they do and what they've always done. So it's just like, you know what you're going to get and you're never disappointed. Yep. Dude. Yes, man. And just their presence. It's always like fire. You know what I mean? And it's always high energy and aggressive. Yeah, exactly. Aggressive. Love it. But yeah, I always love cadets mm. or just groups that Tom worked with. Mm -hmm. um, out of all your drum course shows, do you have a favorite? Oh, yeah. 2014 Blue Coats. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I would not be surprised. Uh, it was, was just a second. Fun. Yeah. It was just fun, fun show. It wasn't that difficult. I mean, the drill was easy. You know, I was like, man. And people, I, remember, I remember dudes in the sound, like, yeah, it's so hard. I'm like, have you seen Crown 2012, man? <laughs> walking the park. We literally, like, marched in, like, a parade block in, in the opener I mean, at, at this, like, 6-8 part. I was like, man, I could do this all day. That's man. what Mike always says about his 2012. Uh, so he's over there, like, the dichotomy of it, messaging Frankie and Zach. He's like, dude, yeah, it's so hard. We have five mics over here, like, we just did a run through. I'm like, I didn't like, I didn't really get tired. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not joking. Like it was one of the, I, I would argue 12 is probably the easiest top 12 division one drum corps drill for a battery of the past two decades. Like it was dumb easy. Like usually your first full run in spring training. And I, I know if you're a long time listener out there, I've said this story a lot, so I'll try and keep it brief, but we finished our first run through the whole snare line just kind of took a deep breath and went, all right. This is going to be a fun summer. <laughs> Usually you're dying. Like at Blue Stars in 10, mm -hmm. we were dying at the end of our first full run. Oh, really? Yeah, it was hard. That was really hard drill. Mm -hmm. So we kind of glossed over around uh, all your drum corps history. I don't even know what years you marched to end up doing GMU for indoor. 2013 and 2014. Okay. And did you... Obviously, that was living in Virginia, uh, geographically very close, which seems to be a lot of what indoor is. Although now a lot of kids are just like moving these days, which yeah, good for them. But mm -hmm. um, how was that experience for you compared to like indoor being at GMU? Was that when Chris was still there? I'm, I'm assuming. 
Yeah, Chris Gary and his team were, were there for for those two years, thirteen to fourteen. So I actually went to school there. Um, so it was really easy to you know step out of my dorm and go to rehearsal on Saturday mornings. We had some we had some dudes drive up from North Carolina and Maryland and stuff. You know, obviously it's an independent group, but I felt very fortunate to. Yeah, I envy that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Super you know, jealous. yeah, you walk down campus and drum. All right, yeah, sure, right. That's you such know, a too- sweet setup there with that gig. The whole relationship they have with the university and being able to like use equipment and stuff like that but it's mm-hmm. pretty sick yeah it was great you guys had did you have the 13 inch snare drums then or did you have the 14s at one point i feel like they had 13s um i think in 2013 if i'm not mistaken we had the 13 inch green ones and then in 14 uh, we had the 14 inch pearls the 13s feel like I feel bad wearing them. I wore it one time and I felt bad. I was like, you're there with quads and like base five. And I got like this little toy thing. <laughs> right. Exactly. Sorry guys. Like, why can't you do this body? They're like, we can't move these drums around. I'm like, figure it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snare privilege as the kids say these days. <laughs> that, that is valid. Yep. That is. Yep. You know, I heard that um, for the first time at, at, at Genesis camp a couple weeks ago, you know, I called spot safe, meaning like, we we did full battery ensemble, and then the rest of the in the quads and the bass drums had to move because the snares wanted to stay in that spot. You know, I was like, "Yo, hey, oh guys, call spot safe." They're like, "All right, spot safe, snare privilege." I was like, "What'd you say?" And snare privilege. I was like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's a thing now." <laughs> Unless you're on the end of like a ten or nine man snare line, then you get you get some rough drill. But right, right. Anyway, so very successful and fortunate and blessed marching career obviously early age we're able to rock it hold it down and be a part of some really killer ensembles um lots of experience knowledge uh life lessons to launch you into uh your like teaching career and you ended up teaching cults how many years were you at cults four years so 16 through 19 okay um some really great batteries throughout the ensemble even through like changes wasn't there a a ranger change through that ben was there towards the end but somebody was it somebody different there first uh, yeah david uh, dave nelson um was there in 16 and then ben piles took it over 17 through right. 19 right 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 uh really strong lines um uh, there how was it like being on the opposite side of the wall doing the teaching rather than the playing it was cool. I mean, it was a, it was a learning transition. It was a learning curve at first because obviously I was still very young at, at the time. I'm still very young, but you know, in 2016, I've, I'd only been aged out for two years, um, so I can remember. You know, let's just say I, I learned a lot in my four years doing that. You know, I remember being all right. Let's let's in 16. I was like kind of still really in it and wanted to, to drum, 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 drum all the time. I forget to get, give the kids water breaks and you know because I was so locked in, right. Um, and then, of course, you know, over time, I learned, you know, about the more about their experience than rather than the, the product, you know, so there's only so much you can do as a tech, right? Right, right. I find that my teaching style now, I was very much in the same probably mindset that you were like, I'm going to drum with them. Like, I'll play on a drum, I'll play on a drum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like, now I hardly play at all. I'm just like listening and watching and like, all right, asking a lot of questions to them as the kids. Like, I feel like that's the number one tool that I try to to use is like get kids to answer their own questions that I have. Like, all right, so you did this here. What do you think happened? And like get them to like self critique and self clean so that when I'm not there or that somebody's anybody else isn't there in front of them, they can clean themselves and like assess themselves and make themselves better without relying on somebody else to do it. Yeah. I mean, it also keeps everyone all engaged. You know what I mean? Cause there's some questions that, you know, the quiet snare drummer has, but doesn't want to ask it. But if we, the teacher, ask it and it keeps, it gets all the, it gets everyone talking, you know, everyone sort of brainstorming and discussing these things, then it's, you know, it's, it's a worthwhile experience for everybody. Yeah. I always tell kids, like, if you guys learn to think about things the same way, like if I know S1 is thinking about this part of the show the same way as S9 on the opposite end of the snare drum, then the likelihood that it's going to be together is much higher. Uh, if we're approaching this, this mentally the same and thinking about the same checkpoints or pressure points or just whatever timing here balance here then we're going to clean up a lot faster Mm -hmm. so teaching evolution it 
just the same way as playing. You just you get better as you do it. So exactly right. You never really stop learning. And I mean, that's oh. why I love watching and being around like master teachers, like just r- people that are really great at what they do and advocating for teaching and, and education. I love that because I learned so much. I mean, I always like to take a step back and be like, dang, you know, how, how do you get these these kids, you know, given their conditions, let's say if it's in a not so good part of town or they don't have a lot of resources or talent in their school, you get their fire. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's a testament to, to the good teaching and the dudes or women that are in front of them, you know. Oh, for sure. In the group that I teach at for high school was fortunate, like uh, Richard Salcedo wrote mm-hmm. the, the wind book last year. Uh, which he also, for anybody who doesn't know, writes at Carmel. And just like having that dude around and just like listening to the way he talks and like interacts with the staff and like just like asking questions like, so what do you do here? And then just like, well, maybe this. Like he wants to get inside your head before he like actually tells you what he thinks Mm -hmm. um, to see where you're at instead of just assuming that you're at checkpoint A when you might actually be at checkpoint B when you can start from there. Um, And those people like that that are super successful, the all the Pauls and Sandy Rennicks and stuff like those people are just using resources constantly. Like, all right, this, 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 what else can I learn instead of just being like, I got this on my own or whatever. <laughs> right. So in Texas, mm-hmm. moved down there, going to grad school, right. You got hooked up with a few different ensembles you've been teaching and stuff, right. And working with and teaching and writing. What, mm-hmm. uh, what's been your lay of the land down there the past few years? So when I moved there in 16 and I was getting my master's uh, from UT Austin, I immersed myself in the, in the band culture that, that is Texas, like right away. I started teching at a few different schools, taught some private lessons. And then in 2018, I was fortunate enough to take over the battery coordinator role at Rhythmic Force Percussion for an independent group from Austin. Are you still teaching uh, there? Or were I'm you not, this past year? No, no, I just, I just did the one okay. year. Um, Shout out Rhythmic Force this past year. They're virtual product was oh the yeah best. i was getting ready to say they're the they're the group that uh we dug the most wasn't weren't they of their virtual yes. productions this year super yep. innovative man oh yeah it, it was it was simple cool music good video mm-hmm. production they didn't try to do too much with it i guess yeah shout shout out to andrew markworth and and team mm-hmm. you know brilliant writing down there it's cool so cool shout um but yeah, that was that was a very um, memorable season. It was the first time that RF made open class finals and came in tenth place, which was awesome. Um, and then from there, I graduated college and then moved up to the DFW area, and I taught at a, a school for three years. Uh, I took over as the director of percussion, and then now I'm moving to Florida. How was that like taking over and getting to, I guess? finally write and design it, it was it was an eye-opener for me so in 2017 i was fortunate enough to work with uh, vandergrift high school in, in in austin just as a battery tech and they're okay yeah they're okay man no. <laughs> they don't suck <laughs> yeah they don't suck they know what they're doing um yeah so just being around that those educators and that group of kid you know it was i was almost spoiled in a way because it was it was amazing, you know what I mean. You had to do very little motivating, you know. Those kids were it was, it was already a culture had already been established, you know what I mean. So I was just there to you know make good, great, right. And then when I got my gig um, in 2018, my full time gig, uh, it was a very very much a different experience. Um, it's a it was it's a low uh, it's, a, it's it's a Title One school, um, not a whole lot of uh, resources. Or you know knowledge from a drum corps standpoint, um, so you know I had to do a lot of building, and I I, I learned a ton just even just about myself, um, in 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 my three years at at that school, so. Yeah, I mean, I always tell people this too. There are so because people just say like Texas mecca band, like mecca for band. Indiana, Texas, Mecca for color guard, California, Mecca for drums. And I'm like, well, there are those things, but there's also for every great school that you know about four or five that are just the same as anywhere else in the country, just trying to like grow and get better. 100%, man. I mean, kids are kids and there's pockets of good talent or resources everywhere. You know what I mean? Texas happens just to be a really big state with a lot of 
um big cities big cities yeah the areas you know what i mean um so yeah i 100 agree with that evan so got to uh live and learn and definitely earn your stripes i guess so to say mm-hmm. um earn your take i'm mm-hmm. sure you learned a lot about arranging anytime anytime i write i'm like oh this looks good on paper and then you like put it in front of the kids oh like, my gosh Does, doesn't work <laughs> yeah right if the um, kids can't if the kids can't successfully practice it at home it's too hard you know what i mean if you have to be, if you're spending <laughs> yeah. so much time breaking stuff down not even from a skill set standpoint but just from like a you know just how flashy it is it's just too hard so i learned to you know always you know you know dumb it down you know and then if if they need a challenge you know you like you write to the group you write to the audience obviously right um, and so then I learned if, a lot. if they if they grasp it quickly and you see an opportunity like, all right cool we're gonna beef this 16 bar section up or we're gonna add this here add this there to kind of take it to the next level but yeah i'm a big proponent of start simple and, and right. build from there rather because that's because it's super demoralizing when you write harder stuff for young kids in my in my experience and then mm-hmm. you have to water it then you've right. got to like worry about morale and like trying to like get, right you guys don't suck like this is just really hard on the exactly. flip side you start simple and when they get really good at it all right cool we're gonna make this harder now we're gonna add this here and that just helps morale a lot i found in my experience Exactly. Yeah, I had, I had a hard time when I was first starting out writing, like writing things that weren't cool. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, man, it doesn't matter. Like, does it support the band? Yeah. If not then, like, who cares? You're never going to get the credit. Yeah. You know what I mean. And at the same time, like, there's something to be said. We were talking about experience earlier. Um, like a member's experience at being able to play something at a really high level. Like, if it's something that they're, it's it's hard. Mm-hmm. which is cool in its own right. Okay. But if it's something that they can really feel confident and comfortable with as a performer and play really well as a group, like that's its own reward too. When you're able to step out on the field and know that you have the tools and the training and the reps to, to be able to that confidence, to be able to have a good show. Like that's a very comforting feeling. <laughs> exactly. Um, in Texas, you know, there's Texas does it right in in the sense that the 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 system is very, or the process is very systematic. You know, kids start off with if, if they're lucky enough have the high school percussion director go down to the middle schools. They start off with that percussion director from the sixth grade, right? And then they take the percussion classes and they move all the way up to twelfth grade. But the whole time they've had their you know same hopefully the same private lesson staff and the same director. So. That's something that makes Texas very unique. You know what I mean? I couldn't, I couldn't have this long-standing career. I mean, I could. There's pockets all, all obviously all, all all over the country, but it's more obviously widespread in, in in Texas. So yeah, they have a they have a pretty unique setup. I know my right. wife, who's a middle school band director, has listened to. There's a pretty well-known podcast that comes out of a group of middle school teachers and just hearing them talk about their setup and their like homogeneous classrooms and like oh, oh we yeah. have flute class and like saxophone class and it's like she's like well I got band class with all right kids. right yeah dude i could i could empathize with that i mean where i obviously went to high school and where i student taught in virginia it was here's the cadet band right and here's the symphonic it was never oh, are you in percussion class or your flute you know this and that so right exactly um so now it brings us i guess a little bit more up to speed to today where you mm-hmm. just recently i saw a post on facebook that you got the percussion director is that, am i saying that right percussion director gig for tarpon springs high school in florida which is a pretty decent band <laughs> pretty decent school and program in general i mean just yeah what is I, it isn't it a performing arts academy or something it was it's a leadership conservatory so yeah they use, and, they, go ahead any school that has the title leadership conservatory in it is doing things right. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, that's one of the things that attracted me to the gig. You know what I mean? There's a ton of director of percussion gigs out there, but the thing that's the most unique is they focus, they, they use the arts education and the rigorous academic schedule. Like there's AP music theory, which I'm teaching a music technology class, et cetera, et cetera, to advocate for leadership. It's all about like the, the developing the student. And of course, whatever successes happens is a, is a product of that, right? It's a byproduct of that. So go ahead. Right, right, for sure. I mean, you see, a lot of people see the result on the field, um, but I'm friends with Howard. You mentioned earlier Howard Weinstein. Oh, you um, are? Who, 
Um, I'm friends with him on Facebook. Okay. I, I met him through, there's another friend of mine that like knows him from Georgia and all that, whatever. But uh, David MacArthur, shout out David. Um, that's right. Um, so David MacArthur, a guy that I know, and obviously just the small network that is Drum Corps, um, mm-hmm. friends with Howard on Facebook. So I see a lot of the things that he posts and just a lot of the things that they have going on there. Right. And the result that we all see on the field of this, what BOA classifies as 2A size high school, just out there absolutely killing it, doing these crazy productions is just a product of these kids just being well-educated. Yeah, man. Well, educated, uh, well, educated. And, um, the head band director, his, his creative vision, he's a very artistic director. Unlike anyone I've ever worked with before. I mean, I've only been there twice. And then our two encounters have been just very, um, very awesome. He's, he's such a smart guy. He, 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 he doesn't talk too much about like, Oh, we have to win in the competitive, in the, in the competitive aspect of it. It's all about creating good art and portraying that on the football field and giving the students the most, uh, out of their, out of their experience. So they do such fun shows too. I mean, to date, I think one of the, my favorite shows that they've done was actually, they did a bunch of like, uh, they played like Maroon 5 show, like the, the animals and stuff. It's just yeah. killer. They just yeah. rock it. And then, of course, they did like the Ready Player One show, which was right. technologically like that prop, the prop dads or the prop team or prop parents. Right. <laughs> Kudos to them and whoever designed right. all that stuff. But mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, man, you'll be, I guess, moving and uprooting from Texas. When do you land in Florida next? So we we just sold our home here. In, in Texas, and we have a closing day of June 30th, and then my wife works a few more days, and then we're leaving for Florida on the road with our two dogs on July 2nd. On so, the road again. Exactly. <laughs> Backing up the house. So I, I know that you just got the job, um, mm-hmm. but do you, I'm assuming you probably have done your research and been around the program a little bit already and just talking and communicating with the staff as you jump in. Mm-hmm. It's from my understanding do they start like later than like typical groups do like as far as like camp and stuff like that? Um, yes. Um, later than I'm used to. So in the past they've, they've had their ever since. So in, in January they do a, a drum line rehearsal one day a week um, just to sort of get the fundamentals right. And then um, they, they, they do this big, what they call an icebreaker rehearsal at the end of May. This year it was in the beginning of June. It was a little, it was a little later than normal. And in that, they, they reveal the show and they play part one and they meet the parents and all that. And then um, the band rehearses every Tuesday throughout the summer until a percussion guard camp and then band camp. But I, I would say it, it, it is a little bit of a later process than what I'm used to here in Texas. So Okay. Yeah. So once a week, Tuesday rehearsals, kind yeah. of, I'm assuming, just like get the lay of the land, like technique, learning packets, wins are probably learning like articulation exercises, warm-ups, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the color guards probably learning technique stuff. Right. And then when did you say like their actual like everyday camp starts? The end of July is when we have like a percussion okay. camp. And then they do one week of band camp leading up to the first day of school. Wow. One week? That's it. Exactly. Damn. Yeah. I, Right, yeah, I'm used to here. Hey. You have your guard and percussion camp for a week, and then you have three weeks of band camp or four, or whatever, leading up to the first day of school. Right. <laughs> so Dude. this is going to be good. Um, but I mean, they always they always come out killer, man. At the end of the season, it just you know it I mean? just speaks, yeah, I mean, it speaks to the culture. I mean, right. Kentucky here, right. most groups do like three straight weeks before the first day of school, and like oh really crazy amounts, and it's like if you just have that culture established in the expectation and the foundations being built in middle school like you don't have to do three four weeks straight to have a successful season yeah so um tarpon is a is a magnet school it's a leadership conservatory so Mm -hmm. they actually pull from from 15 different middle school theaters one of the first things i asked was you know i in texas the middle schoolers to see my face is huge right I, i i go down to the middle schools every day and i see those kids and we we have we had three feeders at the school that i was um, just at the fact that they have 15, you know, I mean, it's going to be, I, I would like to go down there to, to see those middle schoolers, right. To drum with them, to, so, just so that they know who I am, right. They have a footprint before they become a freshman, but we're going to work out some details on how I can get down to all 15, but <laughs> we'll see. 
Maybe over the course of uh, several weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But again, like what we were just talking about, it seems crazy. Like they only have one week of band camp, but mm -hmm. the marching arts by nature have a lot of rote teaching tendencies, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously, I, I would say for most people pedagogically, very opposite of what you would try to do in the classroom mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. um, but in those like one week camps you're talking about, if you're training the kids to play the instrument the right way, have the right approach, understand the fundamentals, like be able to read all the things they need to read, understand the field the way they need to understand the field, you really don't have to rote teach as much. Exactly. Um, I mean, as, as long as they have the process right, which Tarpon does, and the rest is going to be smooth sailing. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. Well, that's uh, quite the culture for sure. I mean, but like we said, there's there's pockets of that everywhere, and they've they figured it out, and they've got the mold, and if it ain't broke, don't right. fix it. So Exactly. And they have such a wonderful um band booster like organization like the 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 city of tarpon springs is really small and the whole city is behind that band man they love the band we just had our uh icebreaker rehearsal a couple weeks ago and we had the mayor come out we had a congressman wow. come out like um, that's crazy yeah so, so we're going to macy's day um 2022 um and you know we zoomed in the artistic director from that from new york city and it was just a whole big thing but but yeah that that city loves the band and everything they stand for so it's really awesome to see dude the macy's trip it, you're gonna have a lot of fun we just did really? that in 2019 it's killer oh, you did really yeah the band uh madison central high school from richmond kentucky um okay i work with they did the macy's parade in 2019 and i where i'm on staff i was able to go and it was just so much fun old uh no actually it wasn't super cold um it was really, really windy um, to the point that they were actually considering not flying the balloons, which they did. That would have been a huge bummer if they didn't. Um, mm. But like once you like get on the parade route and like you're walking, it was just it was phenomenal. And everybody's like yelling and cheering for you, like because you have a banner with your school name and then you have a banner with like your state. So they're like, oh, way to go, Kentucky! And they're like yelling stuff like Kentucky Fried Chicken. And you're like, yeah, that's us. <laughs> Kentucky uh, Fried of Chicken. Of course, that's uh, what they yelled. Oh my gosh! They yelled some other choice things that stereotypes about the state too. But <laughs> it was funny, man. Like the kids had a blast, and like you're just like playing, walking down New York. So like the sun's reflecting off the sky, and there's like these 50, 60, 70 story buildings, and you're just like in between them, and it's just it's crazy. Wow! So, sounds, sounds awesome, man. Sounds the kids great. and you will all really enjoy that trip. Right. Uh, I think I've made it through my entire list, man. Yeah, I think unless we, there's like anything else you want to anything. touch on or share. Yeah, man, this has been great. No, Always think... fun to get to catch up with you. So I, I haven't know. seen seen you in a minute. So hopefully this year, if I'm down in Tarpon, I'll stop by and watch a rehearsal. Uh, the the <laughs> last few. To... Go ahead. I said we're we're going to BOA Johnson City in Tennessee. Dude, that is a tiny, tiny facility is it like is it? the f i would pre-plan for the front ensemble for set up for that i don't think there's a track or anything um okay so yeah i'd probably pre-plan pre-plan that one good to know all right yeah i'll have to check out the, <laughs> the facility yeah exactly from a logistic standpoint so i'm pretty sure that's that right show johnson city i'm like 99 percent certain but mm -hmm. i'll double check I, it for you i would not know <laughs> I do not do any teaching right now. The last I taught the year before uh, COVID, so eight, no, nineteen season. I've worked with the okay. high school here in Louisville for a few years, and there's a band director switch that happened and stuff. And, and like the same guys I was been working with are still doing the percussion, but I've just got a new job and stuff, and doing data stuff, and I'm not okay. I'm not doing anything right now. Just kind of, I'll let you guys handle the BOA discussions and. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. But yeah. Well, yeah, so, man. I'm Unless down to anything else on your plate. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're all stepping on each other's toes right now at the end right. of this thing up, but that's all right. Well, no, man, it's been real. Thank you so much for the invite. I had a blast talking to you guys. No, your, your name was one that we had tossed around multiple times. Like, we got to have, we got to have Ali on here. And we call you Ali because we knew you when you were 16. But he goes by Oliver now, <laughs> for the record, for anyone concerned. Oliver. But, um, do you, rem also, do you remember? Go ahead. I said, I'll still respond to Ollie. <laughs> <laughs>
random thought do you remember what dvd we always used to put in on 2010 on the bus oh, i don't know pineapple express I can't remember. <laughs> no, it was a comedy it was a stand-up comedy but dave Chappelle. that yeah, yeah, is that Dave yeah. Chappelle? <laughs> we play it all the time. Yeah, man. All right, Dave Chappelle's going on tonight. You cannot <laughs> go wrong with some Chappelle. All right, <laughs> let's wrap this up. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Just once again, check out LoneStarPercussion.com. Code aged out. Save ten bucks on any order of fifty dollars or more. Great opportunity, great deal for anyone that needs some new gear. Uh, check us out on social media platforms. Hit subscribe, like the YouTube channel, patreon.com slash aged out podcast. You can give as little as a dollar a month. Help us out to grow this and improve the podcast and the YouTube channel. Other than that, we will see everybody in the next one. Peace.